Okay, First Samuel chapter 4, First Samuel chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 11, although in the will of the Lord, I believe we'll get further than that, and the title for this uh, subject this morning is Ichabod, a very simple title, but it really kind of summarizes what we're going to be looking at. So we'll look at verses 1 through 11 to begin with. Uh, it says this, <clears throat> First Samuel 4 verse 1, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel, now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Aphek. <clears throat> the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were come unto the, into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that you be not servants unto the Hebrews as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought and Israel was smitten and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a great, a very great slaughter for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. So verse 1, uh, it really, we're, we're going to be looking uh, at the defeat of Israel here. And um, basically, verse 1 and 2 is the first defeat of Israel. We're just going to give you the outline uh, verses three through five is the decision to use the ark. And then verses six through nine is the determination of the Philistines. Uh, they're determined to, uh, to fight uh, like men. And then verse 10 and 11, the disaster for Israel. And then 12 through 18, the death of Eli in 19 to 22, the departure of the glory. So that's kind of the outline we're going to be following. We'll kind of repeat them as we go through. But first of all, the defeat of Israel. But it really begins with a, a reference to Samuel. Uh, and really, many believe that, uh, because remember, our chapter and verse divisions uh, are not inspired. They're not part of the originals. Uh, that actually, this would much better fit uh, the first phrase, at least with the end of chapter 3. It says, the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. Uh, sorry, I'm reading chapter three, not chapter four. Sorry, chapter four, verse one. The word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines. And so it really better fits with chapter three, verse 21, where it says the Lord appeared again in Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. But there, there is a thought, perhaps, that um, in Samuel's uh, life at this time, uh, we, we are learning that his ministry was being heard throughout the land. And uh, we don't hear of him connected with Shiloh. Uh, in fact, he's going to disappear 
all the way to chapter seven. We're not going to hear anything of Samuel at all. And so the thought is that perhaps uh, moved with envy, Hophni and Phineas don't like having him around. Uh, after all, if he's really walking with the Lord, he would expose them uh, just by his life. And so we find him basically going out from there and perhaps beginning to minister throughout the whole land. And actually, we're not going to uh, hear about Samuel until we get to chapter 7 and verse 3. The very next time he's mentioned, it says, Samuel spake in chapter 7, verse 3, to all the house of Israel, saying. And so in between, there's actually a period of 20 years. And I want you just to see this. Uh, first of all, uh, the ark is going to be captured. And if you look at chapter 6, verse 1, uh, it says the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. So there's a seven-month period. And then chapter 7 and verse 1, it says the men of kirjath Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in kirjath Jerim for the time was long, for it was 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And then chapter three, uh, chapter seven, verse three, and Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel. So basically, Samuel disappears off the scene for, for 20 years and seven months. And it's kind of, he's been kind of the dominant person we've been thinking about, and all of a sudden he disappears. And in center stage, instead of Samuel, the ark becomes the central figure of chapter four, five, and six. And actually the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned 37 times between chapter four and chapter seven and verse two. And so one of the things, just as an aside, uh, and I think I've mentioned this before, but I think one of the easiest ways to understand scripture is to look at the repeated words and phrases. And if you're like me, an underliner or a person that marks your Bible, one of the things that I do is I'm reading scripture. First thing, before I do anything else, read the passage and look for repeated words and phrases. And often it opens up a whole section of scripture to you. So for instance, the last session, it was all about calling, call, calling, called, right? And it was a call of Samuel. Well, now four through six, some have suggested this section, you could write over it, arcology, the theology concerning the ark. It's all about the ark. The ark is the center stage in these chapters. Now, just again, as far as uh, understanding this chapter, I want to suggest to you that there's, uh, there's really a very clear division uh, in the chapter between uh, verses 1 through 11, that is why we read that section, and then 12 through 22. And what we've got actually is uh, some what, what I would call Hebrew parallelism, that often in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, you'll, you'll have uh, something written, and it's clearly a parallel uh, kind of account. And so I want to uh, highlight what I mean by that. So verse chapters, uh, chapter 4, 1 through 11, you have this battle against the Philistines. That's the major subject. And it terminates with the ark of the Lord taken and two people dying, Hophni and Phinehas. And again, you see that very clearly. Verse 11, the ark of God was taken and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Okay, that's section one. Section two, 12 through 22 is the after effects of the battle against the Philistines. And it terminates with the report of the ark being taken. So there's a parallel. First section, the ark was taken. Now there's the report of the ark being taken and two people dying. First section, Hophni and Phinehas died. Second section, we get the death of Eli. And then we get the death of the wife of Phinehas. And she dies and in her dying breath, says Ichabod the glory is departed so so I, I think you can see that there's a definite uh, parallelism here and it's fascinating uh, the word of God is such an amazing book to study uh, not just the words of scripture but even the structure of scripture is fascinating as you see these various things 
in the word of God. So again, what a joy it is, what a privilege for us to be able to spend time studying the scriptures. So we want to think now about this battle uh, against the Philistines. And so it begins uh, with this. And now Israel went out against the Philistines again in verse one to battle. Now, what is fascinating about it is it seems that this battle was initiated by Israel. Uh, there's, there's no reference uh, whatsoever of the Philistines attacking. Uh, it seems that uh, the initiators of Israel, Israel went out against the Philistines. And not only do they initiate the battle, they seem to do it without seeking counsel from God at all. There's no reference whatsoever to them seeking any kind of guidance from the Lord in the matter. And you wonder, what were they thinking? How would they ever expect to get victory on the battlefield when they're going into battle without counsel from God? Uh, they're going with their, their moral condition uh, full of corruption. National life was wicked, as we're going to see later on in a reference in Psalm 78. And, and so how, what were they thinking? How did they expect to defeat the Philistines? Now, the place where this battle takes place is between Ebenezer and Aphek. And Aphek was an ancient city located right on the edge of the Mediterranean coastal plain uh, and the Shephala, uh, the foothills of the Judean hills. And it was a, it was a real key place on the trading route uh, between Egypt in the south and the ancient area of Mesopotamia in the north. And people would come up through that coastal plain. So it was a very key place. And the Philistines were south of there. And maybe they were thinking of expanding their territory uh, northwards. And that's why Israel uh, decided that they would uh, put them in their place, so to speak. But Israel basically uh, get themselves in battle array without really any clear direction from the Lord, and they, they go out to battle. And so it tells us that it doesn't go very well for them. In verse 2, it says, the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. So not a great beginning to the battle, especially at a small country like Israel. 4,000 men in one day is a huge loss and uh, should have been great evidence to them that God was not happy or was very displeased with them. Now, before we go any further, maybe we should talk a little bit about the Philistines. And um, we're going to get more into them in future sessions uh, about who they are. But just briefly to say a few things about them. Uh, the Philistines weren't part of the original Canaanite civilization that God had sent, set for destruction. Remember when they went into the land, uh, the Philistines are not mentioned amongst those nations. In fact, like Israel, uh, they were actually people who migrated there. And they migrated uh, from the sea uh, islands of the sea, particularly, uh, many believe, Crete and other uh, islands of Greece. And uh, they also, like Israel, uh, we're told uh, historically, they came into the land through Egypt, and then went down the coastal plain. So they, they came, migrated from, uh, from Greece, uh, seafaring people. They came in, and then they migrated down through Egypt into this coastal plain. And uh, often Israel's enemies are a picture of the enemies of God's people in any generation. And uh, so, for instance, Amalek is a type of the flesh. And uh, we uh, are not unfamiliar uh, with Amalek and his ways in our own experience, right? And in the experience of our assemblies. And so what about the Philistines? What do they speak of typically? And I want to suggest to you that, that typically uh, they speak of unsaved people among the people of God. See, they're in the land, just like Israel. They've even come through Egypt, just like Israel. But they didn't come and experience what Israel did. They didn't come through the, the, the parting of the Red Sea. They didn't come through Jordan. 
So they're amongst God's people, but they haven't experienced God's delivering power like the, the people of God. And as a result of that, they're among the people of God, but they don't have the same appetites. So, for instance, early on, you read about them in, uh, in the life of Isaac. And remember, Isaac is digging wells. In uh, wells, obviously, in Scripture is a beautiful picture uh, of the, the Word of God. And they're filling it up with dirt. Right? And, uh, and so they're having to keep redigging the wells. And so the idea is that here are people among the people of God who have no appetite for the things of God because they've had no experience like the people of God have had. They don't, they don't know anything about redemption by blood and by power. And so they have no appetite for spiritual things whatsoever. They're amongst God's people, uh, but they want what the world wants. And so I think there's a lot of problems with Philistines in our meetings sometimes. We want entertainment. We want uh, what the world has. Uh, but when it comes to prayer and the ministry of the word of God, very little interest in that. So that's, that's just a quick overview of the Philistines. We're going to learn more about them uh, in the days ahead. But the, the simple lesson, in, at least it, so far in this battle, is that disobedience amongst God's people brings defeat. They were living uh, lives that were displeasing to the Lord, and they went to battle, and they were defeated by the enemy because disobedience characterized the saints. And so verse 3, the decision to use the ark. Notice it says, when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? They, they get off to a brilliant start. They, they recognize the defeat was the Lord. The Lord has smitten them before the Philistines, right? So they, they, they're, they're correct in their, uh, their assessment of their plight. Uh, it wasn't just the fact that God had not been with them when they were routed. He was actually against them because of their condition. Uh, and I want you just to see this, that when sometimes God is in active opposition against his people. I'll give you an example. Look at the book of Ezekiel just for a moment. Ezekiel chapter 5 and verse 8. Ezekiel 5. Great prophet Ezekiel verse 8. It says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I, am against thee and will execute judgment in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. And it's a frightful thing when the Lord, because of the conduct of the people of God, is against them. And we have a New Testament verification for that, too. I've often mentioned this, the book of James. It says, God resists the proud, written to the people of God but gives grace to the humble. And the word resist there is sets himself in opposition against the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Uh, look at Revelation chapter two, uh, just a couple of verses in letters to the churches in Revelation. Revelation two and verse four. Revelation two, verse four, it says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee somewhat is not in the original i have against thee because thou hast left thy first love uh, verse 14 same chapter but i have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of balaam uh, look at chapter uh, 2 verse 20 uh, again notwithstanding i have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants, so on and so forth. So again, I think there's a simple lesson here, isn't it? That we, we love to say, if God be for us, who can be against us? And I, and I believe that. But if we're walking in clear disobedience or in spiritual pride, God has something against us, right? And uh, it puts us in a position of uh, not victory, but defeat. So Back in our passage, they're coming to a great decision. They, they realize 
This is the Lord's doing. It says, the Lord hath smitten us today before the Philistines. So what should their next step have been? Well, repentance, right? They should have repented. But what do they do? Instead of repenting and turning to God in prayer and confession, instead they resort to superstition and took the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield. And notice it says, again, uh, the elders, wherefore, uh, the elders of Israel said, wherefore have the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Now, this is not an act of faith, because um, God has not commanded them in any way to do this. Faith always presupposes a revelation from God, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So faith is always based on some prior revelation from God. God has not said anything to them about getting the ark at this time. And so they're acting by chance, not by faith. Superstition and not scripture is guiding them. Now, what made them think this way? Well, I suppose they were looking back to the past and they knew that when the ark had gone before the nation in the wilderness, they had marched into victory. Remember when the ark was at Jericho? Uh, of course, they, they carried the ark around the city and they, they shouted and the walls came tumbling down. Maybe there's an echo of Jericho because they're going to, when the ark comes in amongst them, they're going to shout. Maybe they're thinking, hey, this is Jericho uh, part two. But in Jericho part one, God had given them the battle plan. In Jericho part two here, they're, they're just assuming God is going to do the same thing without any clear word from the Lord. Uh, look at the book of Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10 in verse 35. This is the kind of uh, battle cry of the nation as they, they, they move in the wilderness. It says, it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, rise up, Lord, let thine enemies be scattered. And let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. Again, this was Moses' cry as they traveled through the wilderness. But they're not in the wilderness now. They're in the land. And again, they're, what they're doing is they're borrowing the wilderness uh, battle cry, I suppose, and uh, using that to go into battle thinking that God is going to work in the same lines as he did in the wilderness. And so really, instead of revering the ark as the symbol of God's presence, they were turning it into a religious relic. Now, I want to just say a few things, first of all, about the elders here. It's the first time they're mentioned uh, in Samuel. It says, when the people were come unto the camp, the elders of Israel said, and unfortunately, Every time the elders of Israel say something in 1 Samuel, they make the wrong call. They have a 100% track record of getting it wrong. So let's just look at a couple of other references. 1 Samuel 8, 1 Samuel 8, just to see that the elders of Israel are not exactly men filled with spiritual discernment. 1 Samuel 8, verse 4 it says, then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel to Ramah and said unto him, behold, thou art old and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So the whole idea of making us a king like all the nations, where does it come from? It comes from the elders of Israel. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 17, 2 Samuel chapter 17. And verse 4, it says, The saying pleased Absalom well and all the elders of Israel. So notice when Absalom is in rebellion against David, whose side do the elders of Israel pick? <laughs> Absalom's side. <laughs> They're all on Absalom's side. And so what we can say is that the elders of Israel um, consistently at this time in their history are men not exactly filled with spiritual discernment, 
who constantly make the wrong call. And even their language, notice again verse 3, it says, let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord. That very word, let us, should have given some warning. Do you remember when you heard that again back in Genesis 11? The building the Tower of Babel, let us. <laughs> you see that? So it's kind of like, well, let's do this. And instead of really seeking counsel at the Lord, uh, at the hands of the Lord, and, and notice even how they describe the Ark of the Covenant. Notice what they say. Uh, again, in verse three, let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So they're looking to an it rather than to the Lord to save them, right? And if we look to any it, rather look to the Lord, well, whatever that it is, no matter how much religious symbolism the it has, it's not going to save us. Only the Lord can save us. And so uh, really very disastrous decisions here. And so verse 4 says, So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubim and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. Now, it raises some great questions, this verse. My first thought is, how did Hophni and Phinehas go in to the holiest of all to get the ark and survive and not be struck dead? Right? I mean, it, remember, it's risky business to go into the holiest of all. Usually the high priest goes in there once a year and not without blood. And uh, these guys are uh, already have the sentence of death upon themselves because of their unrepentant hearts. And you wonder, how did they ever survive? And perhaps the answer, and this is very significant, is that the glory, the Shekinah glory, remember the Shekinah glory of God dwelt between the cherubim. But I wonder, because of the sin of the nation, had the glory already departed from between the cherubim so that they could go in there and get the ark. Because I think if the, if the glory of God had been there at that time, Hophni and Phinehas would have been toast, uh, to put it mildly. They would have been uh, just completely destroyed. And then the next question that's in my mind, and I, I don't have answers for these, but they're just questions. Did they cover the ark as per the instructions uh, in the book of Numbers when the ark was to be transported? Uh, num Numbers chapter four, uh, it get very specific instructions on the ark and how it was to be transported. And again, I think my thought is that because they're using it uh, as kind of a, a, a rabbit's foot or a good look charm, they wouldn't have covered it. They would have had it uh, out to be seen because it's, it's their rallying point. But notice verse uh, Numbers 4, verse 4. This shall be the service of the sons of Koath in the tabernacle of the congregation about the most holy things. When the camp setteth forward, Aaron shall come and his sons, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of testimony with it. So it was supposed to be covered with the veil uh, at the entrance of the holy of all and shall put there on the covering a covering of badger skins and shall spread over it a cloth holy of blue staves thereof so there's very direct instructions you're going to move the ark anywhere this is what you've got to do right the high priest got to go in there he's got to cover it uh, i just wonder these guys had such uh, a disrespect for the things of god it wouldn't surprise me if they just went and grabbed it and brought it as it was without going through the protocol that God had uh, given to them. I suppose it's a, a very important message here, too, is this. It's possible to have the ark and not the presence of God. Right? They had the ark, but the presence of God clearly was not with them. Secondly, it's possible not to have the ark and have the presence of God with you. Let you let's look at 2 Samuel 15. 
and verse 25, just to see this. 2 Samuel 15, verse 25, where it says, And the king said to Zadok, Carry back the ark of God to the city. If I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and show me both it and his habitation. So when David fled across the brook Kidron, he didn't have the ark with him, but he did have the favor of God with him. And God brought him back to the land. So again, it would say that having the ark is no guarantee of the presence of God and not having the ark could also mean the presence of God is with you. Now, I say all that to say this. It's very easy to claim God's presence amongst us when it may not be true at all. We often quote Matthew 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst. And we could have all the symbols right connected with the expectation of his presence. The table in the, in the center, the, the cup and the loaf there. In other words, everything looks right. But I wonder about the assembly in Laodicea. I've often thought this, that I'm sure that as they went to meeting, they no doubt said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. But where was the Lord of glory at Laodicea? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's outside the door. The table spread. Everything's there, but he's not there. He's outside, and he's trying to get admission and say, will you let me in? He's calling to them, and he's knocking, and he's outside. And what would cause him to, to move outside? Well, we just have to look at what was going on in Laodicea. Pride, right? They, we're in Greece with good. We need nothing, including you. We don't really need divine help. And their self-sufficiency, uh, their spiritual pride. So I'll say, okay, if you don't need me, I'll move outside and let, let's see how you get on. And they can continue on. Meetings, business as usual, but he wasn't there. And so it's, it behoves us to make sure that conditions are right to claim the presence of God amongst us. Are we in the right condition where he would feel that he would be comfortable with his presence among his people? So these are very challenging thoughts, really, and, and things we must consider, uh, prayerfully consider. Verse 5, it says, when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. And again, I wonder, echoes of Jericho here. They shout with a great shout. But let me just say this. Israel could shout until they were hoarse, but God was not on their side at this time. And again, I think of the prophets of Baal. They also were very sincere, cutting themselves, making lots of noise, but God, their God didn't hear them. And sometimes there's a lot of Christian churches that make a lot of noise, but it's no proof of divine approval or the divine presence. It actually, as we think of it, um, that... I would suspect that the Laodicean church must have had a lot of noise in the meeting because they couldn't hear the Lord knocking and they couldn't hear him calling. So maybe there was plenty of noise in the meeting, but he wasn't in it. And so, again, we just need to be conscious of these things. What, what is the Lord looking for? Let's just highlight this because we can say all the what the Lord is not clearly not happy with. But what does the Lord want from us? Let me just read one verse from Isaiah 66 and verse 2. For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. God says, look, this is the kind of person that I want to do business with. Somebody poor of a contrite spirit and trembles 
at my word, takes me seriously, has a proper reverence for me, not cocky and proud, uh, but has a, a spirit of humility about him. This is the kind of person I love to do business with and deal with. So verse six, when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what meaneth the noise of the great, this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. So they understand what's going on. They get a, uh, maybe they've got spies looking and can see what's happening. And they see that the ark of the Lord was come. And uh, verse seven, the Philistines were afraid, but they said, God has come into the camp. And uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> it was a wrong assumption. They assumed, just like Israel, that because the ark was there, God was there. So they assumed that God had come into the camp. They said, woe unto us, for there hath not been such thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Now, it's kind of interesting. There's, there's a lot of mixtures here, right? They, first of all, they recognize that, that God has come in the camp, but then they quickly slip back into their polytheistic thinking, and they said, the mighty gods, these mighty gods, and then, of course, they're, they do know something about Egypt, but they kind of get things a little bit mixed up. Gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Well, he didn't smite the Egyptians in the wilderness. He smote them in Egypt. Uh, with the plagues. But basically, they do have a memory of what happened uh, in the great delivering power and the destruction of Egypt by the God of Israel. And so as a result of this, they are filled with fear. But notice how they respond, their, uh, their determination. Uh, and this is what I want us to see here, that the, the enemies of God's people even though the odds seem against them, like as they look at it from their perspective, yet they're very determined foes. And so notice what they say. Verse 9, be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that you be not servants to the Hebrews that as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. Now, what they're, they're saying is play the man. Uh, let's, uh, you know, if, if you don't want to be taken into slavery by, by these Hebrews, uh, you got to play the man in the battlefield. And they do, they man up, they play the man. Now, several thoughts that we need to think about before we move on from this verse. First of all, uh, the two woes that they pronounce upon themselves. Woe unto us, they say, uh, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore, verse 7, Woe unto us who will deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods. And so they, they pronounce woes upon themselves. And it's interesting that those woes would not indeed come upon them at this time. In fact, they're going to experience great deliverance. But they will experience great woes in a coming day, the Philistines. And I want you just to look at a couple of references. One in the prophecy of Zephaniah. Zephaniah. And chapter 2, which would indicate that the Philistines would indeed experience great woe in coming days. Zephaniah 2 and verse 5. Well, let's just read verse 4. For Gaza shall be forsaken. These are the chief cities of the Philistines. Ashkelon, a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Woe unto the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Kerethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. So a woe is going to fall upon them, but, but not quite yet. One of the reference, Psalm 108. And again, it's just great to uh, follow these things through in the word of God. Psalm 108, verse 9. Moab is my washpot. Even over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Over Philistia will I triumph. And so, again, God 
uh, is going to ultimately uh, deal with the Philistines and woes will fall upon them. But first of all, there's a principle that has to be dealt with here. That is this. 1 Peter 4, 17, judgment must first begin at the house of God. Yes, he'll get to the Philistines, but he has to deal with his own disobedient people first. And um, so the, the Philistines, um, they are rousing themselves for this battle. And um, <clears throat> tragically, through Israel's disobedience, they, uh, the nation of Israel, created the impression that God, who had so wonders, wondrously delivered them from Egypt, was insufficient to deliver them from the Philistines. That's the impression that the, the nation that are not walking with God are going to give, that God who could defeat the Egyptians couldn't defeat the Philistines. And again, we need to ask, what impressions of God do we give to other people? Do we give a good impression of God? And so he says, be strong to one another. Play the man. And let's not become servants of the Hebrews. And again, we need to recognize uh, how determined our enemy is, even though our enemy is a defeated foe. He, he's not lessening up the fight against us, is he? Uh, and we need to recognize that. And Paul would actually use very similar language to this uh, in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. And he would say to us today, in the light of the battle that we're in against very powerful forces, he would say to us, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, Quit ye like men, be strong. Right? So, so the very language the Philistines used to rouse themselves to fight the battle, the Apostle Paul borrows that very language and says to us, our enemy is also relentless and powerful. Quit ye like men, be strong. In other words, it's time to play the man. It's time to man up and go into the battle and fight the enemy course, not in our own strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But we do need to make sure that we're ready and up for the battle. Well, verse 10, disaster for Israel. The Philistines fought and Israel was smitten. They fled every man to his tent. And there was a very great slaughter for their fellow of Israel, 30,000 footmen. So now, 4,000 in the first skirmish, 34,000 lost. And again, in a small nation like Israel, this is huge. 34,000 men, and it gets worse. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Now, for more details of this defeat, and the reasons behind it, we need to look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78, which is, some of the Psalms are wonderful kind of reviews of Israel's history. And they, they, they don't want to forget their history and learn the lessons of it. So these Psalms were actually songs that recounted their history both the positives and the negatives, uh, the good points of their history and the negatives of their history. And so Psalm 78, and we'll look at verse 58. It tells us about why this defeat really happened. It says, for they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. So this is not just about Hophni and Phinehas. Actually, the whole nation were involved in high places and uh, in um, graven images. And, but you, you can't expect any different. If the priests are corrupt, how will the people be? If Hophni and Phinehas, the spiritual leaders, are as wicked men, then what are the people going to be like? They're, they're modeling themselves on these corrupt leaders. 
And so there's great wickedness in the land. Now notice verse 59. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men, and delivered his strength, that's the ark, into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. He gave his people over also unto the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men, their maidens were not given to marriage, their priests fell, as Hophni and Phinehas, by the sword, their widows made no lamentation. And so that's kind of a, a, a snapshot of the cause of this great defeat. It was moral failure that led to this terrible defeat and left them powerless against their enemies. And that's why amongst ourselves, if we're going to take the fight to the enemy and be victorious, why holiness and repentance of anything that's displeasing to the Lord are so important. And why we need to be preaching this amongst us, because our victory is so tied up with our spiritual condition. If we're not right spiritually, uh, then our assembly will struggle. Uh, we'll experience all kinds of defeats. The testimony will not be what it ought to be. And uh, the enemy will literally come in like a flood. Now, one other scripture reference, and that's in the prophecy of Jeremiah to this incident. Again, this this incident is so significant. Uh, the only other incident that really compares with it was the destruction of Jerusalem and the, the, and the destruction of the temple uh, in the sixth century. So this is, really, this is really a biggie. We're looking at a big historical disaster. And Jeremiah mentions again in Jeremiah 7, verse 12 through 15, talks about this incident. And he, he says, <clears throat> but go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh. So he says, you go look at it. Go see there where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but you heard not, and I called you, but you answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. So he uses what happened to Shiloh as a warning to the generation he was preaching to. And he's saying, learn from your history. Now, the capture of the ark, which was this great disaster, but it didn't mean that God was now subject to Philistine powers, because the next two chapters are going to clearly reveal that God can take care of himself <laughs> without even the help of his people. And the ark is going to cause devastation in the Philistine ranks, as we will see and enjoy seeing, I believe, when we get to the next couple of chapters of what the ark will do there. But this loss of the ark is, is really a, a, a massive uh, event of significance and great magnitude. Uh, the death of Hophni and Phinehas uh, be, uh, really was a fulfillment of the prophetic word given in chapter two by the man of God and then repeated to uh, Samuel uh, in chapter three. And so this disaster is before us. Now, very quickly, we want to look at the next section and uh, we'll notice that this um, man uh, from Benjamin, verse 12, uh, there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent with earth upon his head. And so he, he carries the message of this defeat and he goes uh, not to Benjamin in the south. He goes to Ephraim, to Shiloh to bring the message uh, to, I guess, where the ark was had been previously kept. And uh, he's wearing symbols of mourning, uh, his torn clothing, uh, 
uh, dirt on his head, all symbols of mourning. Of course, they would be lost on Eli, uh, although Eli's watching. He can't see because his eyes are dim, remember? We learned that last time. Uh, verse 13, when he came to uh, low, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. When the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And so here's Eli. What a sad scene. Uh, he's, he's 98 years of age. Verse 15, Eli was 90 and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. Implication is that his eyesight probably deteriorated even more uh, since we saw him uh, with Samuel in the previous chapter. He can't see, and yet he's watching uh, because he's, his heart is palpitating uh, because of the ark, which does show, again, we, we said there's some redeeming features about Eli, and he's deeply concerned and distressed about the ark and the state of the ark. So here he is watching, but he can't see this man with the symbols uh, of mourning upon his head, uh, but he can hear uh, what's going on. All the city's crying out and no doubt lament, lamentation and mourning. When Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, what meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. In verse 16, the man said to Eli, I am he that came out of the army. I fled today out of the army. And he said, what is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, I want you to notice it's kind of progressively gets worse. Israel fled before the Philistines. That's the first thing. That's bad enough that they would flee before their enemies. Secondly, there's been also a great slaughter among the people. As we just saw, 30,000 dead. So, and then thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. You know, this is a father he's telling this news to. So it's kind of news is getting progressively worse and worse. And then we get to the climax. And the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck break and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel 40 years. And many have suggested, perhaps correctly, that his heart broke before his neck broke. Remember, we re read about his heart trembled for the ark of God, and he heard the, no the, the, the message that the ark was taken, and perhaps his heart gave out. He fell backwards, his neck broke, and that is the end of Eli. And I want us to read a verse from 1 Corinthians, very sobering verse. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye, plural, are. And so it would tell us God is concerned about the holiness of his house. And even though in Corinthians, we read in chapter 11, many of them were weak and sickly and some of them were asleep. They'd been taken home to heaven early. But God had taken them out because they did not respect the holiness that belongs to his house. Now, I want to just say this. God is a God of infinite grace and amazing mercy, and we understand that. But he's also a thrice holy God, and holiness belongs to his house. And so these are very, very sobering lessons that we need to understand. And notice uh, the climax, really, of this section, verse 19. His daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself, travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said to her, Fear not, for thou hast born a son. But she answered not. Neither did she regard it, and she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory 
is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken because of her father-in-law and her husband. And again, notice the order. Remember, we saw, saw the order of bad events and it started with the, uh, you know, kind of the least going to the greatest. I think we get something of the heart of this woman that what she mentioned first of foremost importance to her was the ark of God was taken. And then her father-in-law. <laughs> and then thirdly, in, in a poor third place, I think comes her husband. Because I do believe there was some spirituality about this woman. And she says Ichabod. Now I want to think about poor Ichabod. Well, you just imagine growing up as Ichabod. In one day, he lost his father, his mother, his grandfather, and the most important symbol of the presence of God in Israel, all in that one day. And his name meant the glories departed. And every time he was called by name, it would remind him of that terrible day. And that's Ichabod. <laughs> and uh, you don't see many children called Ichabod anymore. You notice that that's not a popular Bible name to call your children. The glory, uh, kabod is the Hebrew word glory, and Ichabod, glory gone, glory left. So what a start to life. And this woman certainly um, lamented that day. It was an unmitigated, unmitigated disaster. And uh, just some quick things to say. First of all, the lampstand of Ephesus, Ephesus Revelation 2, 5, said if they didn't repent, he would remove their lampstand out of the way. Laodicea, they didn't repent. He would spew them out of his mouth. And so a testimony can be removed unless there is genuine repentance. And the message of the seven churches is five out of the seven were called to repentance, which is quite a high percentage. And uh, Summary of the events, 34,000 dead, the high priest and his two sons dead, the ark captured, Shiloh no longer the gathering center of the people of God, an unmitigated disaster, teaches us some very important lessons. One, sin is very serious. Sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. We see it highlighted here. But also... To end on a very positive note, the bleak conditions of chapter four are the perfect background for the coming revival under Samuel. Dark days, dark conditions are perfect for God to showcase his power in reviving his people. And so, although it's a very sad chapter, it has a, a great ending in the sense that this is the dark point, but from this point on, things are going to change, and God is going to work, and Samuel's going to be a key instrument. The ark is going to be instrumental as well, as we will see, Lord willing, next time. But God is going to work in the darkest hour to bring the dawn of the glories of the kingdom age, uh, which will reach its zenith on the David and then Solomon. So it's good to know, no matter how dark it is, it's a great opportunity for God. May God encourage us with these thoughts.